Thanks. Uh, as Leah said, I'm Travis Rotterman. I'm the survey historian at the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. Uh, and today's uh, lecture is on a much rumored, largely never seen large satellite dish located in Montgomery County. We are lucky enough to have the owner of the satellite dish here with us, Paul Davison. Uh, has anybody ever heard the rumors, these largely on listservs, you know, blogs throughout Arkansas, that there's such a thing existed? And we all sort of knew it was folklore uh, until Paul called us and said, hey, what, what can we do with this large satellite dish in a largely uh, rural area? Uh, we were then asked to come out and do a survey on it. Uh, and I started doing some, some background research, uh, leading us to the, to the test, test station that we have here today. So we're gonna play a little game to start off because the term satellite dish and antenna are largely used interchangeably, yet mean two very different things. So let's play a little game. This is a background, but what do you think this picture is of? Satellite dish or an antenna? Antenna. There you go. It is an antenna. That is a satellite dish. <laughs> this is one of the early satellite dishes uh, that was put out uh, this is actually uh, this, one of the CINCOM satellite dishes. So let's start. There's going to be a lot of context in this, uh, straight from early rocketeer uh, research in the 1920s, 30s, and into the 40s. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how Hughes gets, Hughes being not the man, but the company gets involved uh, with such a project, about the satellite dish and how it goes from uh, other locations here in Arkansas into Montgomery County. Uh, and then how it was used. So space and what led up to it. Uh, though the catalyst of the space race is widely known by the launching of the Soviet satellite Sputnik in 1957, it was President John F. Kennedy who instigated the quote space race. The lead up to the space age and to the space race has its roots going as far back as the Third Reich and the technological advances made by Adolf Hitler run Nazi party throughout the 1930s and 40s was that of the V-2 rocket. How many people have ever heard of the V-2 rocket? Okay. The V-2 is stemmed from the growing interwar cooperation among German uh, science, industry, and the army at this point in time. This, is, this happens to be, this is an example of the V-2 rocket down here in the lower left. It was stated at the same time that the Soviet government was creating a heightened state of uh, alertness for rockets and their capabilities. The United States government all but, all but voided the possibilities of creating satellites and intercontinental ballistic missiles at this time by 1945. However, the United States then mothballed the idea all the way up through 1954. It is during this tumultuous time between, the 1960s and, between 1960 and 1963, during the run up to the Kennedy administration taking into the presidency, that the quote, space race was put into warp speed. It is not until the Kennedy administration that the term race was used to describe the accelerated pace at which both countries were trying to outmaneuver one another in getting to and exploring space. The, the idea of the race and the competition was first mentioned in the 1960s Democratic presidential platform, claiming that the Republican Party, quote, allowed the Russians to forge ahead into space. This would be just the first of many adjectives describing the competition between the two governments, which would be used to agitate the public and accelerate patriotism and space exploration as a military plight. The space race was actually not a race at all, but it was a period of time during the Cold War that allowed both the United States and the Soviet Union to flex its military, political, and intellectual muscle through the use of the space program in order to gain superiority over the other. It is at this time that a large contingent of the world's population began to call space in the area of peace. With this overwhelming outcry of the world's population, and the United, Station, the United Nations set out to create a document governing and creating principles for which the governments would have to abide by during the exploration and use of outer space. The action was initially completed through the resolution passed in 1962 entitled the Declaration of, of Legal Principles of Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space. Government long title for a large portion of what we will be talking about here later. Followed later by the Treaty of Principles governing the activities of space and the exploration and the use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, came in 1967. The treaty adopted the original declaration passed in 1962, but added language, quote, banning the claims of celestial bodies and the moon and banning the placement of nuclear weapons 
and weapons of mass destruction into orbit while also making sure the moon and other celestial bodies were used for peaceable purposes. And remember, this is a period in time where nuclear weapons was largely on everybody's mind, uh, the old additive of climb, trying to climb underneath your desk to survive a nuclear attack. Uh, they wanted to try to make sure that they had a document signed off by most of the, the countries at this point in time uh, saying they would buy, buy these rules. Though it was a tough time to separate the military and public sides of space exploration from one another, it is because of the companies creating and testing one system, they were creating and testing the other systems as well. One such company that was leading the way into these technological advances was the Hughes, Hughes Aircraft Company based in Culver City, California. How many people know of Howard Hughes? We all sort of know of the crazy, eccentric Howard Hughes and what he was able to, to put through. So we're gonna go a little bit about who Howard Hughes was, how he got his money, uh, and, and how he tried to blow his money on multiple things. Howard Hughes, Howard Robart Hughes Jr. was called a lot of things since he was born December 24th, 1905, including egocentric, eccentric, passionate, and even determined. Howard Hughes he, Sr. was somewhat of a wandering soul and similar qualities, bouncing from job to job between Texas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. Hearing upon the oil, driller, oil drillers striking black gold in Texas, Hughes set out to start drilling for oil there himself. However, due to large granite outcrops throughout Louisiana and Texas, the drill bits that were being used were almost useless by the time they actually reached the granite shelf. Though almost all of the drill bits put into operations failed, it was one of these failed prototypes that Hughes Sr. purchased, with the idea that it wasn't really a failed product, it just needed to be tweaked. The key changes involved the movement of two nubs at the end of the shaft that had multiple cone shapes, bits rotating simultaneously. With the revolution design of this new oil, this new well drilling bit, the Hughes family was financially set. Yet the innovative nature of Howard Hughes Sr. was not lost on his son. Here's just an illustration of what <coughs> drill bits looked like before Hughes took it and revolutionized it. And the one on, the, on your right uh, is one that he came up with after uh, exploring the idea and moving it forward. So Howard Hughes. By the late 1920s and into the 30s, Hughes was already becoming a fasc was already becoming fascinated with two other hobbies of his own, which include aviation, flying, and film. Therefore, he sort of took those two, brought them together with flying lessons from the 1927 uh, by buying TWA in 1930. He went ahead and started to create a film known as Hell's Angels. Has anybody actually seen the film Hell's Angels? Some people have. Hell's Angels nearly broke Hughes Tool Company. He was going through and basically robbing the company to pay for his film enterprises in order to keep these going. This was like a three year long venture of him building independent airplanes to fly uh, in this film. Given Hughes's love for aviation and planes and flying planes, he set out to design his own with the H-1 racer. Anybody ever heard of the H-1 racer? <coughs> a few people. While the H-1 was being constructed, the entire operation of Hughes aircraft was located out of a hangar in Burbank, California. However, the, popu the popularity of the H-1 racer was kept on gaining momentum. But did the opportunities for Hughes and Hughes aircraft, especially with the rise of manufacturing, thanks to the increase of wartime production, so he just ends up go ahead and he makes the H1, races it himself, sets speed records, but also has contracts for the D2 aircraft, the XF-11, and the HK-1, which is largely known as Hercules. Howard set out to promote Hughes aircraft to the military and government, especially when discussing possible major defense contracts and it seemed that most of Hughes' military projects were never met on time. We have to restart. <laughs> he had the biggest mismanagement of the production board was the H HK-1 Hercules, also known as the Flying Boat or the Spruce Goose, which was deemed up by Hughes in 1942, but never materialized until 1947, with Hughes taking the controls of the plane on its maiden flight. Yet even with all the disasters that came out of the designs and constructing of the planes, it was Hughes's aircraft technological advancements in creating and implementing active radar and other aircraft in World War II that really set him apart.
This happens to be the photo of the H1 racer. And this is here at the Air and Space Museum in uh, DC. And this is the other three that he had contracts for, but largely never went anywhere. The D2 was put together in a hangar in California and then decided that the hangar went up in flames and never got past the prototype. Uh, the Spruce Goose, we, we've largely seen the movies about Hughes uh, being the centerpiece of that, was supposed to be done under contract in less than a year and took, you know, five to get done. <clears throat> By 1961, the two subdivisions created in 1948, Hughes Space and Communication Group and the Hughes Space Systems Division were brought back underneath the umbrella company of Hughes Space and Communication in 1961. With manufacturing and design facilities in Tucson, Arizona, Los Angeles, and Culver City, much of Hughes Space and Communications Company would run out of the Culver City location. Inevitably, Bell Telephone and Laboratory Company was able to get satellites, the Telstar, which we had a photo of, into orbit in July of 1962, followed by then the Relay in December of 1962, and finally Hughes a Syncom 1, which was launched February 1963. All these are sort of leading up to where we're getting with the dish. But experience in electronic failures was unable to communicate back with the Earth, uh, thanks to some of the orbits. Even with the initial problem, Syncom satellite was something that was neither the Relay nor the Telstar had the ability to do. And that was to go into geosynchronous orbit. So there are multiple orbits. Low orbit, um, intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles will get into a lower orbit uh, in order to be used. The problem with that is if you put a satellite into a lower orbit, and they all have different names, in a lower orbit, you're going to have to have hundreds of satellite dishes because they zoom past the Earth so fast. If you can get it into a geosynchronous orbit, which means that the satellite dish will pass about every 24 hours uh, from a given location, you would only really need to have three satellite dishes in order to cover the United States at all times and the world at all, at all times. So that was their plan. And they tried to set that out with CINCOM. The problem with CINCOM is they shot it into space, it got it into orbit, but the technological advances in it would not allow it to transmit back to the United States. Knowing that they were able to get this into geosynchronous orbit and that nobody else could, the United States military and NASA both went to Hughes and said, we need this, we now know what we have, and left everybody else behind. Bell Laboratories, AT&T, those sort of satellites, left them go. And they would take shape and, and, and sort of make this technological advances in communication and future for huge projects in the United States and the world uh, to come. This just happens to be a photo of what SINCOM 1 and 2 look like. And the 1 and 2, they didn't really make changes. It was just the second one shot up into space. With the successful launch of SINCOM 2, NASA and the Communication Satellite Corporation, better known as ComSat, passed the designs presented by both passed on the designs presented by AT&T and RCA for their uh, medium orbit satellites. Now ComSat was a uh, corporation set up that was publicly funded in order to make advances in uh, communication and technological uh, satellite dishes at that given point in time. They are still here. They are still run. I can't tell you if they're still publicly funded. Uh, they once owned the, the Denver Nuggets as a large corporation until it was sold. Uh, so they still are out there and, and making advances in communications. Uh, once in proper orbit, the Hughes scientists believed they would only take three equally spaced satellites uh, with the SIMCOM in order to adequately cover the globe. In articles referring to satellite, or the SIMCOM 2 satellite, it was stated that with the capacity of 250 simultaneous conversations, they would be able to double the present, present capacity of undersea cables as well as more to meet the projected needs in the future. Now up to this period of time, you would see large Navy uh, ships putting out large tele telephone lines, largely at the bottom of the, of the ocean, stringing it from nation to nation. They are still there, they are still actively used, but having this in space, they were able to do more calls at one time than they were with the actual land lines or undersea lines in this case. 
going from space to space. Now this was largely used in 1945 where the United States was worried about the, the Germans actually cutting these lines uh, for communication into places like Britain. But the, the same uh, capacity. It would be then designed to build concept, con, com sets, new geosynchronous orbit satellite, Intelsat-1, or better known as the early bird satellite. With work progressing on the early bird satellite, Hughes Space and Communications company, company set out to perform more research based on the satellites it was trying to create. Up to this point, they were creating them and sort of handing them off, saying, oh, they work, but there largely wasn't a whole lot of testing going on to prove that they worked. A few of them actually, uh, at this point in time, one of the Horn satellites, which I will show you out of Fort Dix, was with the satellite communication, were you able to hit a moving target? So what they did at Fort Dix with their Horn antenna, which I will show, is that they had another satellite dish, smaller than the one that we're going to see, put it on a ship. And it what happens to be outside of South or outside of Africa, ping it off a satellite that was already up and see if we could hit it in a stationary location. Once they were able to do that, then it was the idea, can we hit it while the ship is moving? So they sort of had it stroll out in the waters off of Africa and they were still able to pinpoint where that is. Now we're going to get to why satellites are so big at this period in time and now why you have something the size of your you know, saucer plate sitting on top of your house uh, due to the, the technological advances that we have. With the work progressing, and one of the final and initial satellites, well, this one happens to be Andover, Maryland, not Fort Dix, similar satellite, was the initial Telstar Huge Horn satellite, which stood approximately 177 feet long, and it was through the need of these large antennas that Hughes decided that it needed to expand testing of its communication satellites, and therefore it would need an optimal space to conduct tests. that would not have microwave interference while also allowing optimal coverage. All right, so let's get to why this is so large. Microwaves are sort of, we can't see them, they're there. Uh, up until this point, we needed a very large dish, and the dish is, is shaped the way it is, so that when the satellite microwaves are sent back from space, back to the Earth with these ground stations, they needed a larger area to reflect that data that was being sent, hit the dish, and then have it go back to what the point of the antenna if I can find it back largely up in here. So all this, rays hit this dish, comes back to a central point. That central point then shoots it back down to the center where there is a station to be able to collect that data and send it back to a place where the data was processed. So with the needs in mind of Hughes and set out for the ideal location of the satellite station and, and his research station, it's through most of the in, initial inner workings of Hughes' plan for the research station, was unattainable at the time of, of much of this research, is only after initial con conversations with the Arkansas legislature that information began to be processed and discussed in the public realm in 1964 and 1965. During the initial search for an adequate location, all signs pointed to northwest Arkansas around Fayetteville, given the general location within the United States, as well as the University of Arkansas. There we go. The idea of a $2 million research and testing communication location was taught up by Senator uh, J. William Fulbright in Washington, D.C. at a luncheon attended by the Arkansas members of Congress. President David Mullins of the University of Arkansas, Colonel Carl Hinkle, uh, the director of Ar uh, Arkansas's Industrial Development Commission, and officials from Hughes and NASA. In the meeting between Hughes officials and Arkansas politicians, it was stated that Hughes had two SINCOM satellites already located over the Pacific, while the, the new early bird Intel satellite would be located over the Atlantic. And it was in these meetings that Hughes officials were touting the ground terminal Earth station as a, quote, system that would be a great effect for the future of the world and other nations. Still doesn't mean much at this point. L.A. Highland. The Vice President Hughes set out to add that, quote, Arkansas was chosen for a site because it's the best location for a specific job. He later called the Earth Station just the beginning of a new communication system. As part of Highland's pre presentation, he noted that the project would be completely funded by Hughes' company and that no funding would come from the state or federal government, which largely, largely made the politicians happy. They didn't have to pay for it. 
but it would bring jobs and economic development to the area. Dr. Alan Puckett, Vice President of Hughes Communications for Hughes Aerospace, added to the construction of the present site as a significant long-range experiment to be conducted independently, independently of commercial paying traffic, and that will provide the United States with a terminal point for experiment studies by other countries and should materially assist in rapid development of the worldwide system envisioned by the Act of 1962. It is also in this original meeting that the infrastructure for the satellite communication system was discussed with the, with the original and later final plans consisting of a quote, block house, supporting buildings, and an 85-foot dish uh, and antenna, which happens to be owned by Paul. Throughout January and February and much of March 1965, Hughes's location team scoured much of northwest Arkansas to find a perfect location for the station that would allow for the corporation for the cooperation between the test programs and the, the foreign governments. By the middle of January 1965, the Hughes team had already stressed, was already becoming stressed about the location for the station. Yet while stressing out, outweighed their lack of a site for the research facility, they were still presenting a strong front, stating that the research test station in the 85 foot satellite dish, quote, will only be one of its kind in the United States and in an area where the climate range will permit testing under weather conditions. Because with snow and rain and the ability for those to be shed off of the dish, because snow will largely collect on the dish uh, at this given point in time, depending on the angle at which it sits. And that then interferes with the ability to receive uh, the microwaves. Yet two months later, news had already started to spread about the possibility of the research station being located around Fayetteville, but they were starting to diminish. In reality, for the citizens, politicians, and the University of Arkansas really came to a head in a letter from Henry, Henry Kuhn, Program Manager for Satellite Communications of Earth Station that he used, when it said, quote, It has all along been our, been our intention to locate Hughes Aircraft Company's experimental research station and the satellite communication in the proximity of Fayetteville. It is based on the fact that the area around Fayetteville seems to offer ideal geographical location conditions as well as the proximity to the University of Arkansas, which is a research institution. And the plans for the research and test stations have been discussed in some detail with the faculty of the university and the possibility and of extensive cooperation with Hughes Aircraft Company and the University of Arkansas prompted us to search an area of 35, roughly 35 to 40 miles around the area. The total energy transmitted by a communication satellite is comparable to that of a flashlight. And that by the time the signals of the satellite travel roughly 20,000 miles, 23,000 miles through space and reach the receiving station, even with an 85 foot diameter parabolic antenna, the total energy received is comparable to that of a glowworm. There are therefore in no position to locate our station close to any of the city indoor highways because of the ignition noise and the multiplicity of cars along the serious interference with a very weakly really received signal. We are therefore forced to, to keep substantial distance from these microwave towers, like the ones connecting Dallas and St. Louis, and forming part of the Bell Telephone Transcontinental Microwave Link, used for the transmission of telephone or television programs and thousands of phone conversations within the U.S. Only recently have we formed the plans to construct another microwave system in the area. They were, they were informed of this. There is the possibility that mutual interference between this planned system and the experimental station would preclude us completely from choosing a site in or near Fayetteville. So we can start to see where the problems are starting to, to lie in this location around Fayetteville. But at the same time, they're presenting this front about, oh, we're strong on the connection to Fayetteville. They were already beginning to look at other locations throughout Arkansas. Well, with this letter, the possibility of a research testing station hung in the balance because only two weeks later, Hughes Aircraft and Comsat had launched the Early Bird satellite into orbit on April 6, 1965. The launching of the Early Bird satellite put the possible location in the research station into overdrive. They had to hurry up and get it working. Yet in a little over the month after communicating with the residents around Fayetteville, the Hughes Aircraft Company had already chosen a possible site in rural Montgomery County. It was announced on May 8, 1965, that the site finally chosen for, Hughes, for the Hughes location would be located on a site in Montgomery County, or about 40 miles southwest of Hot Springs. After meeting with Hughes aircraft officials, it is noted that the area was free of all microwave interference, and any announcement by Representative Orrin Harris 
of El Dorado. It is noted that the station would, quote, be used to investigate the various aspects of communicating with satellites of the synchronous type and is in its first Earth station, especially designed for this type of satellite, as much will verify the advantages and disadvantages of various technical approaches. In the article, uh, those touting the Earth station were calling for the, the cost of the facility to be in the range of $2 million. With the possibility of producing over 100 jobs, the quickness in the act that goes in to illustrate the strict timeline of Hughes was using val valuable time trying to diligently find the location near Fayetteville. Yet it is in this announcement by Representative Harris that he stated that the Hughes Aircraft Company was unable to locate there, and it was still in close cooperation with the university. So even though they already had this idea that they were going to work outside of Fayetteville, they still wanted that strong tie to a, a good research institution like the University of Arkansas, so they wanted that to work. The problem is it didn't work, and the University of Arkansas never got back into the game once this was located uh, in Montgomery County. In the article on September 21st, 1965, it states that, quote, there is a sturdy chain link fence and a sign with big letters that spell out Hughes and smaller letters complete with identification that says Hughes Aircraft Company Space Systems Division. A beehive of activity is underway behind the fence as construction moves along in the research and test station for communication satellites. Yet there were problems in Montgomery County. In the location of the satellite dish, there is a low water bridge that is even lower than the low water bridge that is there now. <laughs> so when it rained, or anybody poured a bucket of water into the Caddo River, it would flood, which caused problems with getting this done on time. So the transportation department, along with the county, uh, well, along with Montgomery County, decided they would put a new bridge in, which if you've been over this new bridge, is still low. Uh, but they touted it in using close to $300,000 in building this new bridge over there, that this would be for the economic viability of this area. The problem is there was only one other company located along this road and they decided that if it flooded, they just weren't gonna work. So, <laughs> so they were, you know, the new bridge, it was construction, it was economic development, and the one person that would have helped said, we don't really care if it gets built or not. We just won't come in. While discussing the low water bridge issue with the commissioner of the state delegation, Norman Matlock, the man in charge of the building project for Hughes, stated that the building and site were nearly 70% complete and would be operational by January 1st, 1966. However, by February 13th, 1966, the first photographs of the station were finally being published. Within this main, main attraction was the 85 foot diameter parabolic reflector or antenna. It is through the, though it was originally stated the project would be completed by the beginning of January 1966, the statement in February states that the functional of the latter part may be more like May. These are some of the original pictures as it was being constructed. I will say that these were, these pictures uh, came from a lady who was the secretary uh, here at the Arkansas Research Station. Her name is Ola Bell. She still is alive and kicking. She is a hoot. And in one of the photos, I will show you, these photos are largely, this photo and this photo, were largely taken by her on a crane as she was picked up on a seat and sort of brought up above. This is pre-drone era. So they picked her up and she sort of took the photos from this area. So here we are, here's the, the large crane. This is actually the base of the large satellite dish. This is what is known as the block house. Uh, this is where Paul lives. Um, there's the outside. <coughs> Here we go again. This is as I'm trying to move some of the equipment uh, into the blockhouse. And this is the bottom photo. Sorry, if it's a little washed out. Uh, as them uh, putting it up. Robert L. Scafford said that the project was roughly 90% complete, with most of the computer parts being made elsewhere and being shipped into Arkansas. Other parts of the computer and satellite systems were being developed by the Nippon Electric Company of Japan. And it is stated that the early bird satellite already cost nearly one-tenth the other space, other space communication systems, and the cost of the satellite communications was already one-sixth the cost of previous Earth cables. 
It is through this testing that the Arkansas Research Test Station and, the, and Hughes officials and did, quote, envision the day when satellite communication will encircle the Earth and other cities, remote areas, ships at sea, and aircraft flying anywhere over the Earth will be in instant touch with one another. Took them about 50 more years after this. It is not, <laughs> it is not until roughly March that the Lean Temco bought, there's a picture of Olabel hanging out on top of the uh, satellite dish. Looks like she's actually sitting on the satellite dish, but she's actually sort of hovering by the crane. Until March, that Wing Temco Vought of Dallas, Texas, had installed the large 85-foot diameter parabolic antenna. Given the nature of the testing that would be explored, the entire two to three million dollar facility was never meant to be permanent, and it's always meant to be closed upon completion of all testing required for the state or for the site. Still, it is stated that the entire project was completed by early April 1966 with the formal opening to be conducted at an impromptu closing of the United States Seminar on Communications Earth Stations Technology Conference, that's a mouthful, and put on through the International Telecommunications Union. The conference held in the United States was attended by many American, African, and Western European countries, delegates from spe that specialized in the up and coming field of satellite communication. It was an 11-day conference that specifically talked about various fields of intended gains in the power and bandwidth uh, limitations as associated with earth stations over a short period of time. It was with the closing of the conference, and that is most important to the aspect, that the final day of the conference on May 27, 1966, and the Arkansas Research Testing Station up into operation. Hughes set up to bring all of the conference delegates from the world that attended the conference to the soft opening to the newly completed Arkansas Research Test Station. On May 30th, 1966, as early as 8.30, all invitees, which was 75 delegates from over 30 countries, were all to meet at the Mayflower Hotel for breakfast and registration. At 9.30 a.m., all the invitees were to depart the Mayflower Hotel and arrive at the National Airport by bus and then be transported from the bus to the airport for a flight on Hughes's private plane. Only 15 minutes later, the flight from DC to Hot Springs, Arkansas would depart for a three hour flight. The schedule then states that the charter aircraft would arrive in Hot Springs at 11.15 and delegates would then be shuffled, shuttled to the Hot Springs airport, or from the Hot Springs airport to the Arlington Hotel where they would stay and register for the opening. At 12.30, the Hot Springs Chamber of Commerce was to hold a luncheon of all the delegates in the Arlington. Other notable guests at the luncheon included other Hughes officials, Governor Falbus, Senator McClellan, and Senator Fulbright. This happens to be the, probably the lone and last existing inauguration program That's for sure. that exists. Uh, as part of our research, Hughes, is on, Hughes and all of his paperwork uh, and, and knowing Hughes's egocentric nature, uh, at one point he had the warehouse that he had most of his paperwork in was stolen uh, when he was in LA. So he sort of like hoards his paperwork in all different locations. And then to add more interesting on top of that is that Hughes and the Aircraft Corporation has been bought out three or four times. I was lucky enough, my brother-in-law actually worked for one of the companies that bought out Hughes's aircraft uh, and tried to get in uh, to some of their information on that, but being as it's still top secret and classified, they wouldn't let me. They would let him, they wouldn't let me, and then he still couldn't tell me. Uh, but here's the initial program. Following the luncheon, a small period of settled time, the delegates were then shuttled from the bus at the Arlington Hotel out to the Arkansas Research Test Station. The delegates then arrived at the site at 3.45, and the inauguration started promptly at 4. Following the inauguration dinner, I served with the buffet style and a large canvas tent. Oop, that's not it. Following the dinner at the facility, it would open up for tours and demonstrations until 9 to 10 p.m., when delegates would then be brought back to the Arlington Hotel, and following the morning, the delegates would awake and then be shuffled back to the airport where they'd be flown back to Washington, D.C. The system would then be able to, would then enable many of the earth stations to communicate simultaneously with one another via satellite. It was a development for both Hughes and Nippon Electric. Between the two companies, they coined the term STAR, or Satellite Telecommunications with Automatic Routing. 
Roy E. Wendell, executive vice president of Hughes, described it as akin to having a switchboard operator in space to handle all calls from Earth stations. He later illustrated how the system would work by saying, quote, in the star system, all satellite channels remain in, quote, a pool with any Earth station can draw and require channels. When a call is complete, the channel would in immediately go back into the, quote, pool and become available for other stations in trunk line, which is communications uh, jargon for uh, fixed channels, each earth station is assigned to a certain number of channels which they are able to talk to other stations, even when idle. Thus, the star concept greatly increased the satellite's effective capability, and the new concept developed jointly by Hughes and Nippon uh, called STAR. It would enable the earth station to be viewed of a satellite, to view a satellite, to talk with any other station at random. The STAR concept would then be thoroughly tested in the new Arkansas Research Test Station which is the prototype for a simplified low-cost ground station which would enable many of the nations to join this communication. Now, we start bringing up the idea of other, other countries having this communication, but we haven't talked about who those companies were. At this point in time, this was going to be more of the model that Hughes would basically sell his idea to other companies if, in order to get them to be, to, to be used. Uh, the United States had a few that could be used close to it, there was a large selling point to these companies in Africa. Uh, smaller ones, by the time the Vietnam War rolls around uh, in 65, 66, up through you know, the, the early 70s, what you find is that due to this technology, they were able to shrink the size of the satellite dish and actually made it mobile for the soldiers throughout Vietnam. Now there are some great uh, photos of them using this uh, in the jungles of Vietnam uh, that I have. I just don't have them here. But these are the other sort of countries that are having it. Uh, I was actually, just before I came over here, able to find a publication that somebody had put out, and, and this sort of research keeps rolling out slowly, so I'll have to keep up on this topic. One just got put out the other day showing that India was, they had a certain publication specifically for India talking about ground stations and how they could be used uh, over there at this point in time. What can $3 million really do for you? It can enable the Earth station. It can serve as a test facility for new developments. It was going to familiarize Hughes' personnel with technical and econ economic problems connected with these satellites. It was going to be there to demonstrate the feasibility of multiple access satellite communication systems and to serve as a test center for radio, television, and telephone conversations. Largely what that tells you is this was like the prototype to sell to other countries. I mean, that's largely what this is going to do. The entire, oh, here we go, here is the large tent with the buffet and the delegates from roughly 75 delegates uh, from 30 different countries. This happens to be some photos that Olabel uh, shared with us. The entire facility is noted as being a commercial enterprise and the site was to be used for testing purposes. However, the whole, cell whole ceremony was all part of Hughes Aircraft's promotional enterprise to try to sell more Earth stations, just like the one that was completed here in Montgomery County. For those that weren't able to make it to the site, were met with great fanfare and excited to see the 85-foot diameter satellite. Yet after June 12th, an open house, the entire facility went back to being a fairly sleepy establishment for all those concerned outside of the fence. So, there was another second grand opening as a quote, as a joyous occasion brought out for those around Montgomery County and the surrounding counties to see this large object that was causing such a stir in the years to come. And I attended that. And Paul was there. The fun part is if you read contemporary research, especially in Montgomery County, they talk about this and the, what effect it had and people say that didn't do anything it was said to do. You know, as far as helping them economically and, and bringing viability to rural Montgomery County, this had no effect on them and they largely forgot about it. Here's Olabel. This just happens. This happens to be the lady that sent us all the, the photos. Cattle Gap Research Station facility inaugurated. And when we talked to Olabel, she was very happy to say that this is her car right here. <laughs> and that if she had, and that had she known it was going to be in every photo ever taken of this site, she wouldn't have parked it there, but. She was, she was very happy that it was there. Her spirit is still in my lobby. <laughs> we, we have some, some pictures here. And you, this is a very different time in the 1960s, uh, being politically correct. 
uh, than what we have now, so some of the humor that they had in this research station was, was no longer politically correct. <laughs> the switchboard into space. So this was being picked up by news stations across Arkansas. Uh, really, the Hot Springs uh, Sentinel was picking it up, Little Rock was picking it up, but this was a national news story uh, as far as DC was picking up these sort of news articles talking about the, uh, this new and amazing satellite dish and what it was capable of doing. This happens to be a publication called This is Arkansas. I found this originally when we started to look and I tried to do some background research to see if I could find any of the paperwork from the president of the university at this time and see if I can find the discussions that were had between Hughes and the university. That does not exist. Uh, even in his papers, none of this information is, is on file. Uh, so I, I largely wonder where it went and how these discussions really took place. This happens to be two folks from Nippon Electric testing some of the systems uh, that they had put in. This is what it really looked like. They really didn't do much. They just sort of stood around and, and talked the whole time. They're very photographic. Okay, these are all from, from Olabel. And here she is, she's actually working, or she's faking it, one or the other. She'll tell you she probably wasn't actually talking to anybody. She largely would love to listen to the conversations from station to station, uh, she talked about, because w they had to sort of transcribe what that information was that was being going there. So it, it's more like the initial test were like, hello, how are you, you know? Very, very straight to the point on whether these were working or not. Even though the outside world was largely locked out of the testing facilities, the fun about those was still here as its site carried through uh, today. Yet by 1968, testing of the site was beginning to wind down and the closure of ARTS, as it was known in the abbreviation, the Arkansas Research Test Station, was coming to an end. Old Bell's last day of work at the Arkansas Research Test Station was that on May of 1968, as she helped slowly pack up the facility until the block house was cleaned up and completely headed back to Culver City. Now there were rumors and Paul can vouch for these rumors because he had heard them as well. But this was very, uh, you know, fast bringing U-Haul trucks at that time, throw all the stuff in and deliver it back to Culver City. Uh, and talking to Olabel, she will tell you, you know, this was a very slow fade. They slowly brought things out and shipped them back to Culver City as their testing was, was finished. It really was a two-year experiment uh, that brought us great changes, though those changes weren't really recognized until, until much later. Though the testing only lasted two years in, cat, in the Cattle Gap area, the ability to fe and feasibility of a system like STAR and the use of the early bird satellite changed the way people have communicated since that time. It has become an even, even bigger significance since the advent of the cell phone, which entirely uses the techniques that were explored and tested at this site. Though those at the time time and had the idea, they were changing the way that almost everybody would communicate currently. 2G and 3G cell phone service is primarily run through either time division multiple access, I'm sorry for the communications <laughs> jargon, or code division multiple access, all of which was part of the multiple access testing which occurred here at the test station. While the Hughes company was a key influential contributor to the site, Howard Hughes was not. Roughly at the same time the site was being constructed, Howard Hughes was dealing with the fallout of his loss of the Trans World Airlines, in which he actually made more money. Following his loss of the company, Hughes basically remained in seclusion in the Las Vegas hotel in the penthouse suite, nearly throughout the end of his life, which ended on a flight from Mexico back to Houston nonetheless. At no point is it believed that Howard Hughes actually knew anything about the site here in Montgomery County. So here's what it looks like today. Sorry, it's, it was a little cloudy, foggy, rainy day. So here are a few of the slides. Here's what the dish looks like today. <laughs> so it sits up on a very high berm and large staircases sort of lead you up and around uh, the dish. These happen to lead you up into where the main control room was. Uh, that has been largely stripped of all of its mechanisms, which is seeing what you're seeing over here on the right. So what is out of the photo is when the satellite microwaves are sent to the dish, 
there then sort of, you know, the shape of the bowl directs that back up to the antenna. The antenna then shoots it right back up and right out here is a small opening. It would shoot right back to a screen that would have been right there in order to help analyze that, which would then be brought back into the main blockhouse, analyzed and interpreted. Here's another photo. This just happens to be the base on which it sits. And here is, and this is the best part, Paul, Paul loves this. Here is the single and only plate on there that talks about who built it, lean 10 foot watt. Serial number one. Wow. This was the first and only. Uh, other ones were built largely after that, but the, the technique used sort of shrink it down smaller. It is still there. And here's Olabel. The guys in there had fun with, with poor Olabel. It's called the saga of Olabel. Hello, coffee, oh, Hughes, cream, I mean, sugar, car research, oh, hell, forget it. Just pass the call to somebody else. So that was their fun comics of, of Olabel. So I want to end you with a thank you. This happens to be the thank you that they wrote to the general public uh, that was put in the newspaper by Hughes. And it says, the project manager of Hughes Aircraft Company Research Test Station located near Kettle Gap and Norma Matlock, station supervisor, would like to thank all the residents of Montgomery County who helped make the inauguration ceremony on May 30th into the open house on June 12th, a complete success. Attendance at the open house was overwhelming. Some 1,500 guests representing 11 states attended the occasion is very grateful to know that the citizens of Arkansas and of those of Montgomery County are interested in our work and that we at Hughes feel that this station has been such a success without their help.